Bhagavatam chapter 2, chapter 1, text 30. Translation and commentary by his own wish, but he's putting it this one. Translation. The sphere of outer space constitutes his eye pits, and the eyeball is the sun as the power of seeing. His eyelids are both the day and night, and in the movements of his eyebrows, the Brahma and similar supreme personalities reside. His palate is the director of water, Varuna, and the juice or essence of everything is his tongue. Purport. To common sense, the description in this verse appears to be somewhat contradictory, because sometimes the sun has been described as the eyeball, and sometimes as the outer space sphere. But there is no room for common sense in the injunctions of the Shastras. We must accept the description of the Shastras and concentrate more on the form of the Virat rule than on common sense. Common sense is always imperfect, whereas the description in the Shastras is always perfect and complete. If there is any incongruity, it is due to our perfection and not the Shastras. That is the method of approaching Vedic wisdom. Srila Prabhupada's statement in this report appears to be dogmatic and to endorse blind faith. However, uh, it may be understood like this. Srila Prabhupada is stating that we should accept the Shastri version over that of common sense because he says that common sense is always imperfect. In other words, what is considered common sense may not be very sensible. It may be considered sensible from the platform of persons who are not sensible. But from the platform of actual reality, not so. Now, we tend to think that from our conditioned state or in our conditioned state, we tend to think of ourselves as being capable of knowing, we consider what we see, touch, taste, smell, feel, hear, we consider that to be reality, we consider this to be reality. But from the Shastras we understand that this isn't ultimate reality, it's only a relative reality in which we pop into bodies for a few seconds, which a few seconds of Lord Brahma, which we think is a long time. And then we pop out again. And, or we popped out. We don't just pop out, we are forcibly popped out. And then we are forcibly put into another body. And in each situation we think this is real. The cockroach crawling around in the stool thinks this is reality. <laughs> This is, this is it. This is, of course, he's not a philosopher, though, but as he accepts this to be real, that his position is this. Now, uh, those who are atheistic, they defend this position. This is reality. This is all we can know. But those who are a little thoughtful, they consider that why should we consider this, this tiny little existence or uh, tiny little, even though we don't know of anything beyond this material world, but what we know of it is so tiny, we're on some tiny little planet and according to the modern astronomers this is in one galaxy and then we don't know how many galaxies there are. Our position in space and our position in time in, from both perspectives, it's infinitesimal. So, what is our importance? What does it matter whether Bush gets re elected or not? What does it matter whether such and such a football team wins the such and such competition? What does it matter if. What does it matter anything? What does anything matter? Then you come to the, uh, the so called existentialists who say, well, Nothing matters. It's, it's just everything is observed. They see everything as observed because they see that everyone is struggling to get some kind of happiness, but they see we're so insignificant. What's what's the use? There's no meaning. We're so insignificant. There's no meaning. 
However, the theists reject this platform, and of course the Vaishnavas, they are actual theists, and they can uh, provide the reasoning that the very fact that there is order within the creation, or that the whole creation is ordered, there would be no science if there was, if there was, if it was just all completely unordered, disordered. Then there'd be no study of science. There's nothing predictable, no, no laws of nature, but there are. And scientists presume, presume that they'll go on studying and finding out more of the laws of the universe. So that uh, there is order, <laughs> suggests that there is an orderer with some purpose, with some meaning. A simple example. Someone has made this microphone with a purpose, it's, it's, a, it's a structure. Object. It's very specifically designed and manufactured to, in conjunction with the wires and the amplifier and the speakers, to amplify sound. So it's designed in a particular way for a particular purpose. So, in the same way, if we see there's so much order within the universe, then we can conclude that. Someone must have made it. This microphone didn't just come into being by chance. Someone must have made it. So the universe, someone must have made it with a purpose. There must be some purpose to that. That we cannot see it, that we cannot discern it, doesn't mean there isn't any purpose. It's like if we see a, a microphone, we have a look, we can understand it's some manufactured object. Someone must have made it. And then we can't work out what's the purpose. We we are unfamiliar with microphones. We may not know what its purpose is, but we would be foolish to assume that there is a purpose to it. Now, in modern science with quantum theory, they come to, uh, at the higher levels of science, there appears to be that everything is disordered and chaotic and unpredictable. But that which is interesting because science is, originally science was supposed to uh, give us information about this world that conforms to observed reality, but so many things in quote in theory, of course only theory, and in the practical world that we're living in, uh, scientific rules still apply. And we see that everything is, is ordered, despite quantum theory that everything is just uh, some chaotic movements of different imagined energies or whatever, however we can reduce their theories, but we see that there is order. So this order suggests, that that it not only suggests, but it would be foolish to assume otherwise, that there is an order with some purpose, and that we can't discern, it doesn't mean that there is no one. And the fact that we tend to, we have the tendency to try to find out what is that order, what is the purpose, why this investigation of science, why, why is man, why is he interested in intellectual pursuits, trying to find out what, what, why, when, how, all these questions, this, this uh, intellectual or scientific inquiry comes from asking questions. Why did the apple fall from the tree? Asked Isaac Newton. So, and he, um, applying his imaginative intelligence, uh, he came up with an answer which appears to be quite a, quite a good answer because of gravity, which he says is gravitational theory says because of the movement of the earth planet, therefore it, it produces gravity. So, uh, that there is order, suggests there is an order with some purpose, and that we have the 
strong tendency we see inherent in, 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 in the more intelligent class of human beings since as long as we know that has ever existed. There's a tendency to want to try to find out why. So this, uh, this question is uh, impossible to answer from our perspective. But if we consider that there is an order of his soul power, then uh, it's only reasonable to presume that he provides us the answers also if we know where to look. And that is Shastra. As Prabhupada explained when he was asked about the Shastra, that uh, he probably gave the example, this microphone, it comes with a manual. What is the purpose and how to use it? So in the same way Prabhupada explained, the universe comes with a manual, which is the Shastra, which tells us what is the purpose and how to use it, how to live in this world to fulfill the purpose, how to use the microphone means how to use it to fulfill its purpose. You know, you have to plug in and you have to put the, the, right, the wires in the right place and everything. And then the purpose of the microphone will be fulfilled. So in the same way, Shastra gives us direction. How to live in this world to fulfill the purpose, which is to understand that we don't belong here anyway. And we should get out of this place and go back to home and God it. Now, it may be difficult for us to understand this. And Shastra is not surprising because it is knowledge from beyond the platform of our present level of understanding and experience. If it was, if the knowledge within Shastra was within our present level of understanding and experience, then we wouldn't need it. Uh, if, if it was something that we could find out by just looking here and there and this and that, then we wouldn't need Shastra. We need Shastra to give us that knowledge which we cannot find out by any other means. So, uh, it, it may be difficult for us to understand and it may seem, some of the things in Shastra may seem absurd. But if it does, that we can understand is due to our own lack of ability to understand. Some things may seem absurd, some things may seem contradictory. Someone challenged me on that recently, that you know, Shastra is contradictory. So, I gave the example, it may seem contradictory to you, that's only due to your lack of ability, to you, your lack of knowledge and thus lack of ability to understand it. Just like in, uh, in the lower level of mathematics, we are taught uh, that there can be no square root of a negative integer because any negative integer multiplied by any other, any minus multiplied by minus gives us a plus. So then there can't be any square root of a negative integer. It's not possible. So we learn that and we accept it as an axiom, mathematical axiom. But then when we come to a high level of mathematics, we find that the square root of minus one is required for solving problems at a higher level. Similarly, uh, in classical physics, we, we learn about the atom with and subatomic particles, electrons, neutrons, and so on. But then in higher level physics, quantum physics, we find out there's really no such thing as any particle, it's just all waves of energy. So it appears to be contradictory, but actually both, uh, both statements are, are true, but it's at a different level of perception. Even though it appears to be contradictory, from one level of perception it may be seen like this, and from another level where one is more in uh, higher knowledge and higher level of understanding and able to appreciate that, then uh, he can understand that that is true, but more true or more, more complete understanding is that of course, this is according to the scientists. I'm not saying that I necessarily endorse any of it. But I'm just saying this is this is what goes on in uh, this, this goes on in the material sphere of knowledge also. 
So similarly, it may seem that there are contradictions in Shastra, but such contradictions we should understand as Prabhupada states here. If there is any incongruity, that means any apparent incongruity, it is due to our perfection and not the Shastras. So this point should be accepted with faith, not blind faith. Just like if we are studying in school and we, we, we are given some subject matter, and the teacher gives us some subject which we don't understand, it's beyond our level of comprehension. But we have, we may not be able to comprehend it, but we don't reject it, we just know it was more advanced than I am able to understand my present stage when the teacher will explain it, and then I'll be able to understand it, we have faith. So in the same way, uh, there may be statements in the Shastra which are they not, they, they don't seem to make any sense. It may seem like that, but then we should understand that what is our sense anyway? We're, anyway, we're nonsense, that's why we're in this material world. And having come to this situation, we suffer from four extremely serious defects which block us from having perfect knowledge. Namely, non pravaya karana parta This uh, tendency to make mistakes, to be illusioned, that we have imperfect senses, and that we have the chiti Cheating propensity means we like to pretend we know something, even though we don't, but we like to pretend we understand something, even though we don't. Or we like to uh, preach something, even though we know it's wrong, because we don't have to say you're wrong. Or we stick to some situation, even though we know it's wrong, because we have to maintain our position as a teacher. Quite a few years ago now, I was going around the hostels at, uh, at University of Verona. What's it called? Maharaj? Rao or something like that. I can't remember the name. Sayaji. Sayaji Rao University. So they were having the All India Science Conference then. And I was going around the hostels where the delegates were staying. And distributing life comes from life. I sort of think that was what we do. So I met one uh, I met one delegate and I showed him the book and he said, What's all this about? And I said, Well, this shows that Darwin's theory is complete nonsense. And he laughed and he said, Well, we already know that. So I asked him, Well, why are you still teaching? He said, well, we don't have any other theory, we to teach something. <laughs> this is called cheating. <laughs> it's a very strongly, deeply embedded in the modern cycle that scientists know what they are talking about. We know what we are talking about. But if you, it's, it's, uh, if you dig a little bit deep, you'll find that they don't know what they're talking about. They, they're expert in talking in such a way. Yeah, so uh, within, uh, <laughs> within 10 years, what is that, the Pan Am, the American airline company, which and then bankrupt. They were selling tickets to the moon. Uh, in 1968, they were supposed to have gone to the moon. One small step for man and one great step for mankind. So Pan Am was selling, you know, given advance, so that you can be on the first commercial flight to the moon. Well, it never happened. And not only because Pan Am went out of business. It's, it's, it never happened. And they're not going there anymore. They're, well, we don't think they ever went there anyway in the first place. <laughs> but uh, with great confidence, they said, yes, we'll be having flights to the moon. About 15 years, I saw in a newspaper an advertisement from Singapore Airlines that within five years, we're going to be having flights Singapore to London in one hour. New technology is coming due to this. Superconductivity. <laughs> Still in that. So, like that, Prabhupada exposed their sham. In future, we shall produce life. Prabhupada exposed it. Post dated check. Exposed. They, they simply say, we shall do in future. 
No problem, I'll do this every morning. Okay, I'll come here back to some. A little mosquito now, just something, you know, just to get started. They're making this big jumbo jets. But they, they, so many times they crash. But you see, if you see all the little insects that are around the light, there'll be thousands of them clustered around, like, all flying, like, all close here. They never <laughs> How is that? <laughs> you can't make a... You can't make a radar system for your airport that all the, that so many planes can all come in at once and they won't crash. So how is this? By chance? By chance? All these little insects they're flying and they never crash? By chance? Foolishness. <laughs> but it's being promoted as science. <laughs> Something very Laudable, wonderful, the advancement of human society. And now we science is so wonderful. It improved the human condition so much. So it's a great shame. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, it seems to be that often, even among our devotees, this is it's like something very deep in the heart. It's like material attachments. We can't really live can't really give it up. This, this, this. How can everything be wrong? I mean, no, it's, it's not that bad, is it? I mean, that where I came from. I mean, I wasn't really that stupid, was I? Wasn't I? I mean, science must, must be something good. Right? <laughs> something good that can produce a microphone. Or I don't say that we have got to solve the so you the solution to the uh, mysteries of life. I just refuse to make a microphone. Is, uh, that again, Prabhupada exposed. They make they make a few tech, they develop some technology, and then they say, "Well, according to science, we understand there's no God." Which is it's it's unscientific. So that you can develop a microphone doesn't give you any eligibility to speak on the nature of reality, because you can manipulate some a few elements and make something which amplifies sound. It's got no relationship to the nature of reality. And then they're speculating about, well, in the beginning there was a big bang. How can you understand? How can we understand? If we, we come to this site in Ljubljana, and uh, how will we find how will we find out what this site looked like 2,000 years ago? Is there any way we can find out scientifically? Or you can speculate there was some forest in this Exactly what was there, who could say? And then they want to go back millions of years and say how the universe came into existence. The bizarre theories. They're very scientific. There was, there was nothing, absolute nothingness. You can't even imagine what it is anyway. And then there was nothing exploded. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then, here we all are in our university getting degrees. And I'm uh, telling people that, yes, everything was nothing. I mean, not everything, sorry, but nothing was nothing. And, and then there was something. And I gave the Nobel Prize. So, this, uh, but this faith in modern science, uh, modern the whole thing, modern society, we're making a better tomorrow with everybody. The government really has your best interest in heart and all these kind of myths that we feed us. It's, uh, we can't escape that if we remain in Asan something. The whole society is misled, that we should be able to see. So, if we associate with Asad Sambha in the form of materialistic people, TV, newspapers, comic books, and so on, then this, this misconception, either directly or subtly, will enter our consciousness. We can be, our consciousness can be purified by remaining in the atmosphere of Krishna consciousness, by studying Bhagavatam, by chanting Hare Krishna, by 
fully dedicating our lives to Krishna, whatever status of life we may be in, whether brahmacharya, grihastha, vanakastha, or sannyasi, whatever, making very clearly that our goal of life is Krishna, then we can remain in the Vaikuntha atmosphere. Otherwise, when we come, what happens if we associate with this material world? Of course, we are living here, so we can't totally disassociate the source from it. But if we give our if we give our mind to these materialistic to the materialistic way of thinking, then our heart will go with it. On the everyday mind, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu generally the mind and the heart they they're connected. So the materialistic person, uh, his heart follows his mind. His, and so we accept, we mentally accept. Yes, I am this body. I am Slovenian, or I am Croatian, or whatever. And then our heart goes with it, that we feel attachment to Slovenia, which, anyway, what is Slovenia? There happens to be some, some land here with some hills and some rivers, and some people call it Slovenia, but there's no, there's no actual substance, there's no... There is no actual Slovenia. It's just that we, we call it Slovenia, and some people are living here and we speak a certain language. But there is no there is no actual entity. There's no substance. It's it's an abstract idea that we have given a flag to, and we draw a map with boundaries, and we have a government and all this. But it's all it's all. And it has no actual substance. But we take it to be real, and then we think, Slovenia, my heart, I love this country. <laughs> and we cheer our football team, Slovenia. Because we feel that I belong here, but we don't belong here. We don't belong anywhere in this country. But this is what happens. That, uh, when when we give our when we give our mind to the materialistic way of thinking, then our heart follows, and we become attached. We become we become attached to thinking in the materialistic way. We become attached. How can you say anything against the scientists? We become upset. How can you say like that? So this uh, Krishna conscious means to understand reality from the perspective of the Param Sati, the ultimate reality, who actually knows what's going on. Our position is something like that of ants crawling around. And what can the ant, even if the ant is crawling in the room, what can the ant know that this is some this room is a temple room and it's in a city called Lumbiana. Just by their position as an ant, their ability to understand more than their little hole that they crawl out of and find some sugar, their ability to understand beyond that doesn't exist. They're limited by ant body, mind, senses and intelligence. So similarly, we are like that. We may have great aspirations to understand that yes, we shall understand everything by sense, we shall control, but it's really our, we, we can't understand much more than the end because in terms of universal measurement, we're not much bigger than the end, and our intelligence is much more either. So if we take knowledge from he who has set up everything, then we can understand, to some extent, as much as our ability, as much as we have ability to do so. And some things we may not understand. We might never understand some of the descriptions of the Shastra. But then we should understand that our... Uh, we, we should not think because we can't understand. And therefore the Shastra must be wrong. We should understand that. So that's my limitation. It's not the Shastra is wrong. It's our puffed up idea to think that, that if I can't understand it, it must be wrong. Isn't that amazingly egoistic? I can't understand it, therefore it must be wrong. It's, it's very 
egoistic, but as if you know I'm very knowledgeable. But actually, such an attitude is a, is a an expression of an incredible foolishness. Although it passes off as great intelligence. Well, scientists they can't see God. That means there's no God. And this and they're supposed to be. And people say, oh yes, if you're intelligent, you shouldn't believe in God. And this is such foolishness. But so. Uh, but they're thinking this is intelligence. So, first thing, uh, protect ourselves. Uh, and as devotees, we're supposed to uh, understand and accept these points. But uh, always there's the possibility of reverting back to that mayic consciousness. So, we have to protect ourselves by regularly studying the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And, of course, this uh, distribution of these books, it's, it's also a mission to change the world's way of thinking. What's the best way to be free of mind? Well, how are we, how are we getting affected by mind? Because the whole atmosphere is simply full of mind. Everyone moving so good way was to change the atmosphere. So there are different ways you can do that. You can go and live in my home. That may not be so easy. It won't help everyone here. So the better way to change the atmosphere is to distribute these books. And the atmosphere will change. And it will be better for all of us. So that's one way of uh, helping. How we can become Krishna conscious. Just make the whole atmosphere Krishna conscious. Then it will be very easy. Of course, it's not such an easy thing to make the whole atmosphere Krishna conscious. Not very easy at all. But it is possible. And the attempt to do so, uh, that also helps to keep us strong. Otherwise, if we think that we shall just adjust ourselves to the present atmosphere, that's where all the problems, so many problems come up. If we think that, well, I'm just adjusting the Krishna consciousness to, to the way things are. But Krishna consciousness doesn't go very well with. It doesn't go at all with the materialistic way of thinking. So even though we have to live in this world, we should uh, physically we may live in this world, but we should live mentally, we should live in the spiritual world. Not by imagination, but by following the process of sadhana bhakti, which what that does, the, the process of bhakti carries us to the spiritual world, even while the body is the that is possible. That is required. Yeah. But that basis of our involvement in Sagra Bhakti is faith. If we don't have faith in Shastra, if we don't have faith in the process, then how can we advance So Why will we even want to follow it? So nowadays we have some very intelligent devotees who make statements such as that, well, we, we can accept what. We can say about the spiritual things that are in Shastra, but not the material things. Because after all, you know, Vyasa he didn't have telescopes, so what did he know? So now the science, we should accept the scientific theories about what is correct. But such an attitude that uh, we may think that, yes, this is, this is actually a very intelligent approach to understanding Christian consciousness. But what happens is, it undermines our, our faith in anything in Shastra. When we're, well, I'm reading about the spiritual, this is Krishna's Leela, it's very nice. Oh, what's this about uh, Krishna expanded himself into so many forms of the Gobis and lived at the Govardhan Hill and he swallowed the forest fire? Right? Hmm, well, that sounds. Well, I don't think we have to believe that. What do you think? No, no, I don't think we have to believe that. Either. Okay, well, let's edit that out. And then you're left with nothing. And then you get to the level of Christianity where you just have God. And what does God do? Don't know, don't care. And, you know, God is just somewhere out there. And you pray and He'll send something. He'll send some food packages down. Uh, with uh, more butter this time, please. <laughs> so uh, that's God, you know. There's, we don't do there's his name, all the qualities, pastimes. How can we believe that? You see, uh, Krishna, he made the, he made the sun had gone down, he made it come up again. Well, it doesn't sound very scientific. And then we're left with nothing. And then we were just left with, uh, with, uh, with God means 
whoever or whatever I want to believe, if I want to believe. And then uh, we remain in the material world and we never understand Krishna. So faith is required, not foolish faith, but faith that there is higher reality, benevolent reality, person. There are certain things which, by applying logic and intelligence, we can understand. And then there should be an order and there should to this universe, and there should be purpose. And that we can understand by applying our intelligence, but exactly what he does and why he does it and what he looks like, we can't understand by logic and intelligence because that's that's existential facts of his own existence according to his own choice. Just like, for instance, we can understand that in this country there must be some head of state, either prime minister or president or whatever. It's it's reasonable to assume that, is it not? That there should be. You don't know. You don't know, but uh, we should presume that there is some head of state. If you don't know, well, you don't know. think so. You're entitled to your opinion, but actually you're wrong. So if there is some head of state, why who's right? I think all these rascals sitting down there. <laughs> maybe there. Maybe there isn't. There maybe there's an interim stage or something. You say, what is it, president of Slovenia? The prime minister. Yeah. Prime minister. The prime minister. Yeah. Yes. Well, okay. So head of state must be the president, actually. Well, the, the prime minister is the actual hands-on, and the president is the, is the one who goes and cuts ribbons when they open hospitals and things like that. So, uh, okay, so the president is the official head of state. So, uh, what does the president like to eat for breakfast? Eggs. You know for a fact? <laughs> so stop speculating. <laughs> He's vegetarian. Okay. All right. Now we know. How do you know? Really? You didn't just guess it. You didn't. Uh, you didn't arrive at that by some uh, scientific logical inquiry. He announced it personally, and therefore you can understand that he's a vegetarian. Okay, but why didn't you find out scientifically? You should have done some scientific analysis and logically concluded. But it's not possible. That there is a president, we, or that there is a head of state, we can understand by inference. But what he likes to eat for breakfast, what he likes to wear, what was it? He likes to watch on TV who his wife is, what she likes to do. You can't find out by logical analysis because it's his own personal preference. So in the same way that there is God, we can understand even by inference. But what he is, what he does, what he looks like, who his girlfriend is, that we can't find out by logical inference. If he tells us, we can know. Just like he, in this country he's declared, I am a vegetarian. So now you know. But if he doesn't tell us, then how will we know? Maybe his family will know, but who else would know? So, like that, in Shastra it describes who is God? What does he do? What does he wear? What music does he learn? Whose girlfriend is? What does she like to wear? What do they do together? So this we find out from Shastra, we just have to accept it. If I say, I don't believe the president of Slovenia is a vegetarian, prove it! Said, well, he said, how do I know he said? That is, you're just making it up. Then, then you become unreasonable. And then you can't know. If we, if we say that we must scientifically understand, then we have to, we have to go to this residence, and then, well, they won't allow you in. Then how are you going to find out? <laughs> or if like this idiot sitting here, you say there is no head of state, how are you going to convince him? He's such a fool. <laughs> so, and no one would attempt to prove it to him, right? Because he's just a fool. He doesn't believe, no? Okay, uh, as far as we have a... You know, we have a nice mental hospital, we don't have a case for you. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> so, uh, so, like that, if the, uh, the scientists say, like, well, we don't, we don't believe there's any God. You know, we have scientific theories to show us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
What's that hospital's name? <laughs> <laughs> but they're going up because everyone here is crazy. It's the madhouse. In the madhouse, the one who's like the, the most mad, they're saying, no, no, no. <laughs> really this is what's going on. Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize means you are certified as the biggest donkey. That's it. The biggest among them all. The one who can make the biggest. Oh, no, the biggest donkey. And then they're going to say, no. <laughs> Wonderful. Give them a Nobel Prize. But what, is, what are they talking? They have no action. Or oh, they've, they've, they've discovered so much information about this tiny little speck called Earth that we're living on. But why are we here? What is the purpose of life? Who is God? God. God doesn't come inside. So much for the purpose. Now you may say, well, some scientists believe in God. Maybe. Well, but the general ethos of society, it's, it's a materialistic ethos based on the assumption that the purpose of life is simply to enjoy our senses. And even if they so called believe in God, what they believe in God, it means there's some cosmic order supply. And so that we believe in God, there was daily breath. And so on. When we die, we go to heaven and then we enjoy ourselves there also. So they don't know who is Krishna. They have no idea who is Krishna. That's why even to call Krishna God, it's, it's better not to, be, to use, to say God. Probably you would say the Supreme Person of all. God is God of all. What is that mean? It means something like that idea that you have of God, but much better defined more. If you say God, then people say God, then, then, they, then all their misconceptions come. So, better to use a, a Roman, that's actually what it's good to use. It's, it's good to say Krishna, rather than God, God, God. And we think we're all having a very spiritual conversation with someone. You say, yes, yes, I believe you, but then you, you ask them, what is God, and then no personality, or just some, some ill-defined cosmic order supply. So better come to the point, Krishna, who is described in Shastra. Well, of course, in many cases, it's, it's, it may be even to discuss with people. I mean, people have such little knowledge and such shallow intelligence when it comes to this point. That, uh, really, the, really, to bring people to the point of inquiry, then, then uh, we can get this knowledge. Otherwise, people think that I already know something. I already know who is God. I don't need to. You don't need to. I need to. Then, uh, then it becomes impossible. They think they know, but what do they know? So, how do you finish that? Srimad Bhagavatam Gita. Srimad Gita. Some more books of my what different books, different. <laughs>